My name is Ashley Fernandez. I'm currently living in Bellbrook, Ohio. My husband's in the military, so we move wherever the Air Force sends us. My interest is hanging out with my baby, soaking up my husband, and volunteering around the community. I'm very active in our church, which I love, and um, some of the hobbies I enjoy doing. I enjoy painting with my family and just soaking up the good times and sunshines. What makes me tick is definitely sunshine and good times. I like to spread positivity wherever I go, and I love spending time with my family, friends, and meeting new people in our community. I just like helping people and just living my best life. Some of my hobbies include, well, before cancer, I used to love playing roller derby. Um, unfortunately, because I have bone mets, I'm unable to play right now, but I'm still an avid supporter and listener, so we like to go to the roller rink and skate. We enjoy being outdoors and just soaking up time with each other. I guess my biggest fear, which is a random fact because I usually don't let on that I have fears, but my biggest fear is just not being present and not being able to make the most of each day. Because if you talk to me, you wouldn't think that my mind goes there, but every day I like give myself positive affirmations to let myself know that I could do anything I want. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer after finding a lump on my breast. I was metastatic from the start. The breast cancer I have is triple positive breast cancer. So um, hormone positive and HER2 positive. It spread basically all over the skeleton. Um, when I got diagnosed, we did a bone scan and the bone scan lit up like a Christmas tree and the doctors were in awe that I wasn't in a lot of pain. When I first noticed, I did self checks um, in the shower ever since I was younger. Cancer does not run in my family. I don't know my birth father though. My mother had me a little bit younger. So I didn't know anything. And my mother's side, nothing runs. No, there's no breast cancer or anything, but I've always been told to self check. So I was showering one day and I felt a lump. I called the doctor and they said that it was probably just a cyst to come in. So I went in, got checked out and they said it was a cyst. So I said, okay. Well, I showered again and I did it again next month and I felt two bumps. And I was like, there's no way it could be a cyst. So I called the doctor and they said it was nothing. Um, they didn't want to do an ultrasound. They said that my death, my breasts were very dense. I was too young for cancer. There was no history, not to worry about it. But something in my body just told me that this was so much more since it happened so quickly. Um, by then I was able to call and I went to patient advocacy and just figured out what I could do for myself. They finally decided that they would give me an ultrasound. When I got an ultrasound, I found out that, oh yes, you should get a mammogram. When I got the mammogram, I got a false negative, but then because my breasts were dense, the radiologist said that we could go ahead and do an MRI just to be on the safe side. When we did the MRI, they saw that there was numerous cancers on my left side breast, like numerous tumors. And it looked like spiders were just all over, honestly, when you look at the imaging. So that was really, really scary especially because I was getting told for two months that there was nothing and I was basically just making a problem out of nothing and getting more people involved. So that was kind of trying, but that's where my advocacy began, like advocating for myself to get better health care and to get treated and to get a diagnosis and to figure out what to do next. So. And that was in Alaska where we were living then. That's where we were stationed. So when I finally got the MRI, I got the, um, they saw that there were spiders. Well, it looked like spiders. I call it a spider imagery. Spider imagery. Um, I got to go to another, this was really cool. So I didn't have to go to base anymore. I got to go to the breast cancer of Fairbanks the Breast Cancer Center of Fairbanks. And those people were magical. From the time I sat down, she was like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. You have this, 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 we're gonna go do, you're gonna do an echo to make sure your heart's good. We're gonna do biopsies. Like they had a plan from A to Z and it was so fabulous to not have to think about anything. They assigned a case manager and it was just 
beautiful and easy. The way it came to NBC diagnosis was they hadn't done a bone scan yet and we were gonna do chemo that Tuesday. I had my port signed, um, I had my port appointment to get placed on Monday and I had chemo chemo the following Tuesday. I had mentioned that Monday when before the port placement that my right rib was hurting and the PA was like, oh, we need to do a bone scan. She said, has it hurt before? And I was like, well, sometimes it gets a little sore, but I am active. And when we did that, it was just showtime. Did the bone scan and then I got the call to come in the next morning. And that's never a good sign when you get a phone call to come in the next day. So I came in the next morning and I found out that it was metastatic. I didn't really know what that meant because like I said, usually, well, actually there is no usually because there's no common grounds with breast cancer. There's no common ground with any cancer. It doesn't discriminate of anything. So yeah, I got that diagnosis, found out that it was everywhere in my bones. My doctors were fabulous. I got a little upset and she was like, so what do you want to do? Like, how would you like to handle this? And I said, I want to take it head on. I got a three year old and I'm trying to be here. And she was like, let's do it. And she was so encouraging. And she said, hey, um, I just want to let you know when you hear stage four, it's scary and it should be and people do die. But you need to know that there's lots of options out there. And as long as you're willing, you can still have a successful life and help others find a cure. And I swear that doctor was a life changer because she made me refocus everything and everything I felt when I was scared, it was like, it went away and I was like, okay, what are we doing? Ah, I can't even explain it. It probably sounds like gibberish, but it was so powerful. I did remember the feelings I had. I honestly was like, okay, stage, four. first they said, oh, it's metastatic. A lot of people don't know what metastatic was, and I was one of those individuals. I didn't realize what it meant. And I was like, okay, so let's just go take the boobs off, and then I'll be fine. And she was like, no, it's all over your skeleton, honey. And I was like, okay, so what does that mean? And then when you hear that it's a terminal diagnosis, it really does change your life because I had just turned 31, and I was like, <gasps> I had a two-year-old, like, it was life-changing. And the first thing that went through my brain was like, what am I gonna miss? And oh my goodness, am I about to die? So I really had to do some reflection as in, how do I wanna take this? And how do I wanna live the rest of my life? I do feel that all of us are given, I don't wanna say like, this is a purpose, but I do feel that everything does occur in this whole world for either a lesson, a plan, or to help others. and. I'm not saying that cancer helps people. I am saying that cancer has allowed me to see things from a different lens. One of my favorite quotes is from Wonder Woman, which she's phenomenal. And her quote is basically about faith and strength. See, it says there will be miracles. And then at the end of the day, all you need is strength and hope. Hope that it will be better and strength to hold on until it does. So that's how I feel about NBC, because I mean, I know that there's a lot of us that are passing away from this because we're getting killed. But I know with research and stuff, one of these days there's gonna be a cure and we're all gonna be okay. So that's my faith. And I heard that movie in the movie and I was like, OMG, she's talking to me. And then I saw this sign and it says there will be miracles. And it just reminds me that Ah, there's good and if we just hold on and remember we're all gonna get there and goodness will still follow us I'm Mexican and African-American so I'm Hispanic and black black women get diagnosed at later stages sometimes I sit at home and I watch these commercials and I'm like what there's so many young people with cancer or why is there nobody with curly hair? Where are the rest of us? Like, we're not misrepresented all over. I think it's important to know that women of color and Hispanics and black women all over are dying because we don't have the resources to be diagnosed. And there's another thing of misconception, like sometimes if you go to the doctor a lot, your family thinks that you're a hypochondriac because you're not sick. You know, 
I think that's why sometimes we get, we don't have, yeah, it's just scary. I know that, yeah, it's difficult. Like here in Ohio, there's so many ladies that are black and they're getting diagnosed at such young ages and so far advanced, they don't have the money to go get checked out. And when they go get checked out, they're treated as if they don't matter. So therefore they don't wanna go get that free handout to go get checked out because they feel like when it happens, they're going bankrupt or, you know, it's just, you hear so many stories and you talk to other people and you try to uplift them and you just hear their heartache because they're not getting the same help. and people aren't running to their aid to help them and lift them. Ladies, you are worth it. You're worthy of all the good in this world. So make sure you take care of yourself. And if you feel you need something, talk to those doctors, talk to those people, keep talking, screaming until you get to where you need to be. When I got diagnosed, people were looking at me like I was making it up because nobody believed me. They just kept saying like, oh no. Your boobs are just big or oh this please take your health into your own hands you matter and you're needed in this world so please please treat yourself as though you're worthy as well my doctors and nurses are exceptional with me um but i can see for an example i know somebody that doesn't relate she doesn't she doesn't think she's a woman she is a woman and she has breast cancer but she's looked at differently because of her challenges and her sexual orientation and she's black good thing about being treated in the military base is we don't have to come out of pocket of anything because my husband's serving our great um nation so that's one blessing and one thing that we were really really excited about when I got this diagnosis was first, we were like, oh my goodness, cancer's expensive. How are we gonna do this? Because we were getting seen off base. And then we got moved to Ohio. And here in Ohio, they have the cancer care unit on the base. So financial isn't really a thing right now. And that's a big blessing because I know a lot of people are having to sacrifice other things in order to live. So that's just one thing that I'm very fortunate with. And I've been advocating and writing Congress for letters so that we could get care for all. Tomorrow, actually, I'll be working with an organization and we'll be calling, taking on the Congress. It's important for us to share our story so that when someone's newly diagnosed or is looking for someone that looks like them or just represented, you see someone and you're like, hey, she did it, I can do it. You know, you get inspired by seeing other people just living and thriving and just being out there. So if we're able to help somebody else, please share. You never know when your story is gonna help somebody else. So I'd encourage everyone to share. I was thinking peer-to-peer -peer supports. I was thinking we should do something like that for women of color ethnicity. Because women of color is a big blanket, right? It's a safe blanket. So it consists of like Asians and Island Pacificers, Hispanics, Black ladies. Oh, don't forget our brothers. Because, you know, there's some brothers out there. So you're invited to brothers. Have you ever been to one of those conferences where you could just go meet and then you see everybody that looks like you? Imagine if you had that in a Zoom call, like maybe quarterly. It doesn't have to be once a month, like quarterly, just to engage, invite, and develop. And so other people can see other people and maybe they'll connect with somebody that they don't even know had cancer or they didn't haven't even came across on the Facebook groups. Like I'm on the Facebook groups, but I'm kind of a ghost on those groups because sometimes I don't see things the same way that other people that have cancer, that have our diagnosis of our cancer. And it's not that I'm in denial, it's just that I choose to keep my mind in a different space. So if you post on there, sometimes if you're not willing to back up what you have or really, really like boom, 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 lay down the law, I get really nervous posting on those Facebook pages. We're all there to support each other and love each other and just be with each other, which fellowship is so good during this.
I know in some of my community, like, you know, they're like, well, why are you saying you have cancer? You know, if you just believe you don't have cancer, you won't have cancer. Like, if only. Don't you think all of us would heal ourselves? If only. I mean, I know there are miracles out there, but come on. But yeah, so sometimes people just are scared because you don't know how your family is going to react. And even if your family does know, will they ever say like, oh, hey, my daughter has cancer? No, because they're in denial. And because they're in so much of denial, it makes the rest of us sometimes. I actually am one of those that I'm like, oh yeah, I have cancer. I put it out there right away so nobody gets misconstrued. My daughter's always like, oh yeah, my mom had the chemo. <laughs> like, she's five. So, you know, she puts it out there on play dates. So I just let everybody know like, bloop. Hey, I have cancer. Let's not make it weird. I'm good right now. You know, if you want to learn, I'm an open book and I'm willing to educate. But other than that, we're just like everybody else. Like, I don't know why it's such a taboo or why it's such a hard thing to say, hey, I have cancer. Like, it's not. Because we're so much more than cancer. Personally, for me and my family, it's changed us completely. Um, my husband's working from home. My daughter's supposed to be starting kindergarten and she's doing it virtually. So that puts me in a different hat because not only am I gonna be struggling with my own fatigue issues and what I'm feeling, but now I need to figure out how to teach my daughter um, and be present, you know? Like sometimes I have a lack of energy and I was worried. And honestly, I still am worried to see if I'm gonna be able to give her the best education. She deserves the world. And sometimes, you know, with this disease, we don't know how we're gonna feel. One day you feel great and the next day you're puking your brains out. like. You really don't know what's gonna happen day to day. So that's a challenge for my family at right now at the moment. Just our little girls starting kindergarten, she'll be starting virtually and we just need to figure out, I mean, I know I'm gonna rock it, but I gotta figure out how I'm gonna get to that level of rocking it. My oncologist isn't doing telehealth. She still wants to see us every um, 18 days because I get treatment every 21 days. So I'm still seeing her every 18 days. And as far as telehealth goes, I'm only seeing my psychiatrist through palliative care over the phone and that's phenomenal. They actually just offered us to be able to come back in person and I'm really enjoying this Zoom telehealth. It's so nice not having to leave your house sometimes. Patients and others, if you don't feel like you're getting the health that you deserve, please advocate for yourself. We're the only ones that can change what's happening. Um, if you're scared, it's okay to have a level of fear, but don't let it challenge or take away from the medical treatments that you should be receiving or the care you should be getting. If anything, every patient center has a patient advocacy. If you don't feel comfortable talking to your oncologist or your team, please go see that person and let them express your concerns so they're able to help you and navigate a way to get what you need done. There's so many resources out there that sometimes we don't even know are available to us. You just need to talk to others and connect and sometimes you can learn about other things as well. As far as um, my treatment, I think just the wait times too because my spouse isn't allowed to come with me anymore like because of COVID he has to wait out and sometimes like when I heard I had to stop treatment it was done over the phone this time just because she knew I was going to need that additional support and he wasn't able to come into the clinic. I started counseling because of COVID. I, so it's crazy, I'm 33, I got diagnosed, I had a great job working for the government, you know, we lived here, I was able to transfer in when I moved. During COVID, my whole life changed, I haven't left the house, well, I started leaving the house just recently, but I wasn't leaving the house since March 12th, it was my last day of work. I actually ended up being retired, medically retired, April 3rd during COVID. So I had to get used to this whole sense of normalcy and my mental health was okay, but I definitely needed someone to talk these things with that wasn't my spouse. So that's how come I started counseling. And honestly, I don't know why I didn't do it when I first got diagnosed. It's life changing. People, if you're listening and you feel that you need somebody to talk to, I definitely recommend counseling.
break the stigma. It's good. I honestly wish someone would have told me that was available to me sooner. And I think I would have took advantage of it. Actually, I know I would have took advantage of it because I didn't even know I had that, I had access to that until I finally talked to somebody and I was like, hey, you know what? I really could use someone to talk to you. Zoom's not cutting it. I don't want to lay these burdens on my friends, on my family. They have enough going on with everything that's going on in the world. And I would just like, a, you know, a neutral party. And man, legit. I live in Ohio right now, and I haven't met very many metastatic patients that live in my area. There's a few groups that live in Columbus, which is about an hour and 30 minutes away from me. So I'm in connection with them. And we do FaceTime and we do monthly calls and we do weekly check-ins and it's just a really good community. And it feels nice to have others that know exactly what you're going through and you're able to lift them up if you're doing better or vice versa or just pray for them, send them positive vibes. Like, hey, sometimes an I'm thinking of you changes the world. Like, hey, I was thinking of you today and they're like, what? It makes me feel so good. I don't have too many fears about the world reopening, honestly, because I feel what everybody's feeling right now in COVID is something that we experience every day. We don't know when our last day is gonna be. None of us do. But the fear that people are scared of catching COVID is probably how we feel every single day because we don't know when we can catch anything. We're always, our immune systems are always compromised. So I guess what I'm going for is kindness. I hope that the world took kindness from this pandemic. They take away kindness for the rest of us that are living with chronic, and just diseases, terminal diagnosis, just, you know, kindness is really important. And if you felt this and that fear, just take a moment to remember that that's what of, some of us feel every single day of our life. And be kind. We don't know what anybody's going through. That's, that's what I want for the world. <laughs> Try to make the best of each situation. Because if we just sit at home and are like, oh, we're stuck at home, I'd be miserable, man miserable so I've been doing like taking tours of countries on YouTube and trying to make a new meal and I am not a great cook so those meals are not coming out good but I'm trying to get out there and be adventurous and still live and make the most of what we're what we're dealt with